Hey guys, today I am reacting to How the Navajo Nation Works A Country Within a Country by Window of Productions. So uh yeah, should be interesting. And if you could just subscribe to the channel and like the video, that would help out a lot. Let's get into the video. Window was made possible by HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code Wendover14 to get 14 free meals plus free shipping. This isn't really the United States. This map, while it may display the technical, internationally recognized borders of the country, just is not fully accurate. It should look more like this. And also not really including, That's because um, the also not really including Alaska, which probably has a lot of these as well, like enclaves, uh, Native, Native American territories inside of it as well, as well as countries within, I guess. And also, yeah, Hawaii as well. 89,000 square miles or 230,000 square kilometers now missing from this map are filled by 326 Indian reservations, and the Native American tribes that manage these lands are recognized by the U.S. federal government as sovereigns. That's to say, while these may not be countries, they are, by most measures, independent, sovereign nations. Collectively, reservations... That's pretty epic, actually. So maybe a bit like... Wales and Scotland, I guess Northern Ireland a bit as well. Nations account for two and a half percent of the U.S.'s total landmass, and together would represent the twelfth physically largest state between Michigan and Minnesota. Truly, the only commonality between each of the reservations is the system through which they are recognized by the U.S. federal government. They range dramatically in size, system, and function. The smallest, for example, is the likely ranchera in Northern California. At just 1.32 acres, it's physically similar in size to many suburban home plots and is used as the cemetery of the Pitt River tribe. There are also plenty of larger reservations without any permanent population. For example, the Ontogonon Indian Reservation in Michigan's Upper Peninsula is mainly used by a branch of the Lake Superior Chippewa tribe as hunting and fishing lands, and the small Snoqualmie Reservation is almost entirely composed of the tribe's casino. But of course, a majority of reservations are inhabited by anywhere between 1 and 174,000 people. At the up That's a lot, yeah. upper end of that spectrum, there's the physically largest, most populous, and, by many measures, most politically developed Indian reservation, the Navajo Nation. Yeah, yeah, I know about the Navajo Nation in, in the Southwest. Generally, I think that's where you find a higher concentrations of Native Americans. And indigenous peoples. Centered around northeastern Arizona, but passing into Utah and New Mexico as well, the Navajo Nation is physically larger than 10 U.S. states. And I said southwestern, I think, unless I said southeastern, but yeah. And has a population greater than that of 18 U.N. recognized countries. Now, according to the U.S., the Navajo Nation is sovereign, but it's certainly not a country. So, what is it? Now, like all Indian reservations, the story of how the Navajo Nation came to be is complex and tragic. Its Diné people have inhabited the Southwest since their migration from Arctic America around the 15th century AD, but the path that directly led to the establishment of the reservation began with the Long Walk. After years of conflict between European Americans and the Diné, the U.S. federal government directed the army to end what was, in their eyes, the Navajo problem. Soldiers descended on Navajo land, destroying much of their civilization, and one by one forced bands of Diné to walk 400 miles or 650 kilometers from their homelands to Fort Sumner in New Mexico, where they were imprisoned on cramped, unproductive land. That's really messed up. Hundreds died during the walk, and thousands more while imprisoned. After a few years, though, the government recognized that they had made a mistake. The camp was costly to yeah, obviously. run due to its low agricultural yields, and they realized the land from which the Diné had come was not what the U.S. would consider useful for its settlers. In exchange for a number of provisions aimed at assimilation, the Navajo and the U.S. signed the Treaty of Bosque Redondo, ending the internment and effectively establishing the Navajo's reservation around their homelands. Still, though, in the decades that followed, the reservation looked little like the nation of today. Change accelerated in 1921, though, when the Aztec Oil Syndicate struck oil one mile south of the town of Aztec, New Mexico. This would go on to be developed into the first commercial well in the region, attracting considerable attention nationwide. 
While this first site was outside the reservation, large oil companies soon recognized that there were almost certainly productive sites within Navajo borders. U.S. Secretary of the Interior Albert Bacon Fall, who was quite friendly with the oil and gas industry, and later would become oil and gas industry. Uh. Um, the first presidential cabinet member in history to go to jail after accepting bribes from the industry. As you should, yes, we should do that today as well. Recognized that further oil and gas development in the region would require the Navajo system of governance to look a little more like the U.S.'s. At the time, the reservation was administered through a decentralized, somewhat informal, traditional form of governance, which made negotiations with big American companies difficult. Therefore, Fall organized a Navajo Business Council with three positions filled by three of his appointees, all of whom were Navajo, but also friends of Fall or the industry. However, Bureau of Indian Affairs Commissioner Charles H. Burke recognized that this was far from a democratic process an unelected council making decisions on behalf of all the Diné people, so he worked to set up an elected tribal council, the new core of the nation's legislative system. Still today, that council serves the same purpose, but its establishment snowballed the Navajo government into something far more formal, sprawling, and western. The sovereignty of the Navajo Nation is best examined through its capital, Window Rock. Its streets are lined with the offices of all the agencies and organizations running the government functions that the Navajo Nation handles itself. The Division of Public Safety, the Window Rock Police Department, the Office of Community Development, the Navajo Nation Veterans Administration, the Navajo Housing Authority, the Navajo Nation Telecommunications and Utility Agency, the Fish and Wildlife Department, the Heritage and Historic Preservation Office, the Tribal Courts, the Supreme Court, the Office of Vital Records, the Council Chambers, and the Navajo Nation Office of the President and Vice President. Many similarly named structures could also be found in county, state, and national capitals across the U.S. and world, but there are some missing. Also dotting the landscape of Window Rock are features like a branch of the United States Postal Service, an office of the Arizona Motor Vehicle Department, Arizona State Route 264 maintained by the Arizona Department of Transportation, and an airport administered and regulated by the American FAA. Adding to that, one sees many of the chain services and stores of the United States. Aflac, H&R Block, Ace Hardware, Wells Fargo, Chevron, Bank of America, Quality Inn, McDonald's, and more. However, there is also a small, unique business landscape. There are Navajo Petroleum gas stations, owned by the Navajo Oil and Gas Company of the same name. That's interesting, yeah. I mean, hopefully the Navajo people are profiting off of it. Name, Basha's Dine, Dine, Dine Market, which, while owned and operated by the region-wide Basha's brand, is a unique sub-brand carrying goods especially in demand by Dine, like Bluebird, Flower, and Mutton. And there's the Navajo Times, which, while originally ran by the government, is now a for-profit, financially independent newspaper. So, the government and economy of the Navajo Nation is an amalgamation of Navajo and American features, so considering that, can it be considered truly independent. Independence is defined by a lack of dependence, so the answer to that revolves around their relationship with the U.S. The federal government's official terminology as to what tribal reservations are is, quote, domestic dependent nations. While that term originates from an 1831 Supreme Court case, it's never used elsewhere to define what any other geopolitical entity is, either in the U.S. or internationally, so it's rather ill-defined. Therefore, for all intents and purposes, domestic dependent nation is essentially interchangeable with the term Indian Reservation. While what an American state is is well understood and defined, what an Indian Reservation is is defined by a patchwork of decisions, guidelines, legislation, and treaties. For example, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 made it so that all remaining indigenous people living in the U.S. not already a citizen would be granted such status, meaning, functionally, that all those living on tribal nations are obligated to pay taxes to the U.S. federal government, as the U.S. uniquely that could be a bit annoying. taxes on citizenship and not residency. However, when members of tribes live on tribal land, they do not pay taxes to the states that that land is also Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And maybe they can develop their land more to make it more like productive, I guess. So then, because I heard a lot of people, I heard a lot of Native Americans don't live on Native American land, unfortunately. And they live in like, most Native Americans live in cities, I've heard, especially like in California. Like LA, for example. So, a part of. 
Window Rock, for example, is technically part of both Arizona and the Navajo Nation, but its residents only pay taxes to the latter. The tribes themselves, and therefore the reservations, do not pay taxes to either state or federal governments, much like individual American states themselves. Unlike states, however, tribal nations have something similar to a citizenship system. Each tribe has the power to define who can become members and what the process of enrollment looks like. For example, in the case of the Navajo Nation, members need to be at least one-fourth Diné by lineage and not a member of any other tribe. Building on that, private property is essentially non-existent on tribal nations. The land is held in trust by the U.S. federal government and then managed by the tribal governments. Therefore, most residents either live in homes rented out by the tribal housing authority or in mobile homes on public lands. That's because banks won't give loans to build housing within reservations as the land upon which they'd be built is publicly owned, so it'd be impossible to repossess the homes if That's a bit messed up. payments fell behind. They will loan for mobile homes since they can be repossessed more easily, but altogether, the policy of public land ownership effectively means tribal nations have immigration control. You can only live in the Navajo Nation, for example, if you qualify for government housing, and you only qualify for government housing if you're either Diné or working in the nation. Adding to this, during the COVID pandemic, the Navajo Nation- And government housing isn't always the best. Hopefully they can make it better in these areas, but yeah, it's been messed up. And ...enacted some of the strictest border restrictions in the United States, essentially prohibiting access to all non-residents except when passing through on state highways, and received no strong legal opposition to such so strict border control? Okay. action. So altogether, the Navajo and other tribal nations have a level of power over who can live and visit their territory that eclipses that of individual U.S. states. However, there are other ways in which these nations parallel states. For example, the U.S. federal government instructs its agencies to treat any interaction with tribal nations as, quote, government to government. Also like states, tribal nations cannot engage in formal relations with foreign governments, enter into a state of war, or issue currency, all key differentiators between nationhood and countryhood. However, somewhat unlike states, the Navajo Nation has this a Washington office. This functions somewhat like the offices of different state representatives in D.C., however, the Navajo Nation Washington office is closer to an embassy than these as it exclusively serves to represent the nation through non-voting means to the U.S. government and its agencies. The Navajo Nation wasn't the first to attempt to represent itself in Washington. In 1995, the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma appointed Charles W. Blackwell as the first tribal ambassador to the U.S. In addition, they opened what they called a Chickasaw Nation Embassy in D.C. Now, neither the ambassador nor the embassy had the diplomatic protections of those of foreign nations, so it's unclear how legitimate they were, but there were no challenges to the nation setting up such a representative system. The Cherokee Nation, also of Oklahoma, is now going a step further, as they believe that they have a legal right to formal representation in Oklahoma is very Native American as well, I've heard so. Washington. An 1835 treaty with the U.S. gave the Cherokee Nation the power to send a non-voting representative to the U.S. Congress, similar to those appointed by the District of Columbia and U.S. territories. Until 2019, the Cherokee never appointed such a representative, but now decided to exercise their rights when they appointed Kimberly Teehee to fill the position. However, as of June 2021, she has yet to be seated by Congress, meaning her power is not yet formalized. While it appears the nation has every legal right to take such action, it's a potentially messy situation as the people of the Cherokee tribe already have representation in Congress. While D.C. and the territories do not receive voting congressional representation, the Cherokee do as they live in Oklahoma, which, as a state, has voting members in Congress. Having people represented twice in Congress would be unprecedented. It's unclear as of now whether Teehee will be seated, but the reality is that this situation is like many involving tribal powers in the U.S. They don't know- I mean, Oklahoma's history as a, as a, as a state is kind of um, messed up in some ways. Because, I mean, they didn't want it to be Native American territory first. The U.S. admitted them as a state instead of as a territory. Or like an, a, re a reservation, so, yeah. ...know what they can do until they try.
In fact, that was exactly what happened in the 1970s when Russell and Helen Bryan of the Chippewa Nation received a property tax bill for around $200 from a county government despite the fact that they were living on tribal land. Having never received such a bill before, and not believing they were required to pay it, they brought it to a local lawyer who brought their case to the state courts. They lost that case, and they then lost their appeal in the Minnesota Supreme Court, but then they brought it to the United States Supreme Court. Their decision said that not only do states lack the power to tax tribal members on their reservations, but that states don't have the power to regulate any tribal activity on their nations. This was huge, and ideas soon arose as to how to profit from this decision. Oh, this was huge. States lack the power to tax tribal members on their reservations, but that states don't have the power to regulate any tribal activity on their nations. This was huge, and ideas soon arose as to how to profit from this decision. Quite quickly, small-scale gambling operations sprung up on reservations, and within years, large tribal casinos started opening. Today, these casinos generate tens of billions of dollars in revenue for tribal nations annually, especially for those lucky enough to be located near major metro areas where gambling is illegal, such as the Chippewa Nation, which operates the largest casino in America, just 90 minutes from Dallas. Damn. Others, such as the Navajo Nation, are less lucky. Located far from economic opportunity, their unemployment rate is 49%, their average household income is $8,000, their poverty rate is 36%, and one-third of their households lack access to running water. Oh, Tribal hell. reservations in the U.S. exist in a sort of in-between state. Some sovereign powers are greater than those of states, but they lack the true level of self-determination reserved for countries. However, being in such a lonely club, these reservations don't receive the attention necessary to reform a system that, in many cases, works against them. For example, the system of public ownership of land means that it's essentially impossible for those living on reservations to own their own home. That means they can't build up wealth through home ownership and pass it on to the next generation. Reservations are located in some of the most rural areas of the U.S., in places already experiencing the effects of deep rural-urban economic divide, but being isolated from the system of states and ignored by the federal government due to their political irrelevance, they perpetually fall into the category of not my problem. While there is opportunity in sovereignty, it cannot be realized without trying, and trying new things is effectively impossible for places so deeply entrenched in a cycle of poverty. So the answer to what the Navajo Nation or any Native American reservation is, is that nobody knows. They're what the federal government lets them be, and so far, there hasn't been enough time or money for them to explore their boundaries. So just over a year ago, I realized something. I had become a takeout and delivery addict. Being a busy person, by the time I got to dinner I every day, I was tired and ready to just relax. Well, this week, HelloFresh just- Yeah, okay. This was a really informative video. Um, Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed learning new stuff, but um, the contents of the video were somewhat depressing in some ways. I mean, there's definitely a bright side, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bit troubling with what's happening on these- uh, Native American reservations in places. So. Let's check out some of the comments. Okay. Sam got tired of waiting for CGP Grey, so he decided to make this video himself. <laughs> and even stranger is the Hopi Nation inside the Navajo Nation. Especially when you consider Arizona doesn't have daylight savings, but the Navajo Nation does. But the Hopi Nation doesn't. But the part of the Navajo Nation inside the Hopi Reservation does. <laughs> Damn. Lived in Tuba City for three years, across the road is Moen Kopi, a Hopi village, which of course does not do DST. But even weirder is the fact that not all of Tuba observes DST. Many of the businesses geared towards the tourist trade stay on MST in order to stay in sync with the rest of Arizona. So in making a point, you not only had to set a time, but also state whether that was tuba time or flag time. That's short for Flagstaff. Damn. <laughs>
The Hopi and Navajo were both proud and sovereign nations. It made their people prosper. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for remembering the Hopi. Yeah. Wupat Key is actually not a Navajo site, but is a Hopi archaeological site. There are numerous similar ruins on Navajo land that they well know of and yet still do not acknowledge that they reside on land that is indigenous to the Pueblo tribes that surround them. They migrated here with the Apache when the U.S. started expanding to the west. Their language map doesn't even match anything similar to the southwest region. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of these people are from, like, much uh, from further northwest than the U.S., and they migrated down. The Insane Logistics of the Navajo Nation I was expecting CGP Grey to do this earlier. <laughs> The emphasis is on the second syllable of Dine, so it's Dine, not Dine. Dine, huh? Cherokee is pronounced Cherokee. Okay. How do you say Jeep Grand Cherokee? I've heard someone struggle so much with pronouncing Cherokee. <laughs> when Wendover talks about reservations more than CGP Grey. They are more like vassal states rather than independent nations. Commit a cr federal crime in any of these reservations and you'll find out exactly how independent they are. If it, if this wasn't mentioned- okay, yeah. <laughs> Let's be real here. The US government hasn't really given First Peoples sovereignty. They gave them sovereignty up to a point. The point being whenever Washington feels like reasserting its will. It will. That's like giving your kids a flag in the tent and telling them the backyard is their own country. When mom and dad say come back inside, you'd better. Oof, a lot of these comments say. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was laughing when he was trying to pronounce Navajo words and names. This guy's Navajo. It was pretty funny. Dine Cherokee. <laughs> Chickasaw here. It was awesome to learn about how my nation was the first to open up a DC office. The Windstar Casino is owned and operated by the Chickasaw, not the Chippewa. The casino paid for like half of my tuition. That's nice, at least it did something for you. As someone who is near the North, the NEOK, Nebraska, uh, Oklahoma casino area, I'm sure the casinos are profitable, but honestly, many nations would be better served by expanding their options of economic development. Maybe casinos are the entry method to funding, but so many options exist to diversify their income. True, true, true. Imagine, you know, more into coding in the STEM field. That'd be pretty epic, I would say. Uh, yeah, the Chippewa live predominantly close to the border with Canada. Nowhere near Dallas. Ah, uh, great video. It's a fairly similar system in Canada. Also, my tribe is oral history that remembers the DNA as relatives. These casinos make tens of billion dollars per year. In a state of perpetual poverty, one third of homes have no running water. Sounds like greed is not an exclusively U.S. sentiment. The taxes from the casinos generally allow for infrastructure to be built. However, many larger reservations have low population density, making such infrastructure expensive. Casinos do create tax revenue and jobs, but also bring horrible social ills. Maybe they could adopt a bit of a Singaporean system, build extremely nice public housing, and, you know, make it very comfortable and integrated for the people to live in. 
you know, more public transportation, um, and build the STEM field. Coding and such from a young age, could, it's possible, it's doable. Use that initial money from the casinos and other, and other, and other things like that. The Navajo Nation sits atop the Colorado Plateau, basically a big boulder. Whenever water lines or roads are going to be made, it literally has to be carved into the ground. The Spanish wrote about how hard Navajo country is. Arid, rocky, no natural borders of water. So to this day, it's very difficult land to build on, let alone live on. Also, a lot of homes are very spread out, it seems, instead of like grouped together, like more dense. Yeah. Uh, let's call it. This is probably a graphic design problem, but the hole in the middle of the Navajo Nation reservation is actually another reservation, the Hopi Reservation, but it isn't co but it isn't co colored like a reservation in the map. That's true, yeah. Seems like there is a cycle of making things complicated for indigenous people, then being frustrated that the situation is complicated. A country within a country, no, not even close. At best, it's an autonomous region within the U.S. Huh. A autonomous region may be pushing it. The tribes hold a degree of sovereignty more so than the states. Historically, natives weren't even citizens and conducted business with the federal government through treaties. In a way, they are more like protectorates. Ah, uh, interesting. This was a really interesting video, for sure, for sure. And um, if you enjoyed my reaction, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and comment down below with your thoughts and opinions. Respect to the Navajo Nation and you know other Native American groups. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.